Hello, everyone. There you uh, go. Wonderful to be here with you. Uh, this is my second opportunity to speak to you uh, at the Bacona Live Conference. I was very inspired uh, by the last one and the sort of 24 hour plus format that you used. And I, I even blogged about it. I said how great it was. Uh, that it was an example that other conferences could use to see what can be done during uh, these difficult times uh, with the pandemic and, and a lot of lock-ins. Um, so again, great to be back. I am excited about this talk. Uh, my name is Bruce Momgen. I am one of the Postgres core team members. Uh, I have been working with Postgres for 24 years. I've been involved with open source for 29 years. And uh, this talk is a very unusual one. Uh, about the democratization of databases, which you probably never thought you'd hear before, uh, but I hope you will find it interesting. Um, the slides that you're looking at are available on my website. If you look at the bottom uh, left here, uh, this URL, there are probably 20 or 30 presentations there, uh, 640 blog entries, uh, a lot of interesting information, hopefully, if you're into databases, if you're into open source. Um, if you're into uh, sort of hardware and stuff, uh, feel free to, to check it out. But this, these, these slides are available right now uh, at that URL. What we're going to be talking about uh, today is a very, uh, as I said, unusual topic. Um, I started to think about this uh, when, uh, when uh, people ask me, how does open source work? Why does it work? Uh, how are you able to produce software as good as commercial companies, large billion dollar commercial companies uh, with no money? Um, how are you able to guarantee, you know, um, reliability and feature set and uh, interoperability and, and, and so forth? And, and I started to kind of think a little more broadly. I, I'm, a, I'm a history major, uh, so I have a tendency to think in historical terms. Uh, and in broad terms. So that's when I got to think about the parallel between uh, different uh, governmental structures and open source. Uh, this is not a topic you hear very often, uh, but I think this, I think you'll find this quite interesting. So what I'm going to start with is talk about the, the history of government's governance structures. Uh, there's actually some interesting information I didn't even know about before I started. Then uh, we're gonna talk about the strengths of each structure and um, also the downsides, the efficiency as well as the messiness of democracy. Uh, you might think I'm just gonna say, democracy is always great. Uh, no, I'm not gonna say that. Uh, there are some downsides to it and I'm gonna highlight that. Uh, we're gonna talk about the ultimate success of democracy. And then we're gonna talk about software governance in terms of uh, history. So what is the history of software governance? How does it relate to um, you know, federal governance or, or, or uh, provincial governance? Um, how does that impact Postgres, is what, which is what I, I do. I'm an Enterprise DB employee and obviously core team member, so I have a real interest in Postgres. Um, and then we'll talk about democracy in action. What, what, um, what does this actually look like? So uh, let's talk about the history of governance structures. You know, I knew that democracy started in Greece uh, from my studies. But what I didn't know is that democracy in Greece started at a specific place in Greece. Um, uh, it actually started on Pink's Hill, which I, I had never heard of before. Um, but that actually is the place where democracy started, where they, the first sort of democratic meetings um, of the Greeks happened, obviously, thousands of years ago. Uh, but I thought it was interesting. Um, but the, the real... Uh, original governance structure is not democracy, obviously. Uh, the original governance structure is autocracy. Um, you can think of it as a, you know, the chief of a tribe or a king or an emperor or a pharaoh or, or you know, something like that. Um, usually it's a single person or a small group uh, of people who are in power. So it could be a dictatorship. It could be a monarchy. Um, it could be communism, which... Um, sort of morphed into sort of an autocratic uh, structure, even though the original goal was certainly not to do that. Uh, but this is certainly the first governing structure 
um, that that you have. And uh, as I said before, in Greece was the first sort of non-autocratic structure. And that auto non-autocratic structure kind of came and went as, as history moved forward. Again, uh, represented democracy first established in ancient Athens. Um, and, and it wasn't completely democratic the way we think of it today. It was really only a small group of the population who could vote, uh, landowners, um, and uh, they elected representatives to, to vote on issues. So it wasn't sort of a plurality of everybody. It was a you know, small section of society, but it was still, it was the first um, kind of democratic representation. So having talked about those two structures, uh, let's talk about the strengths of each structure. Uh, and you'll notice here we have kind of a curved um, uh, castle wall. Uh, it was kind of interesting. So autocratic strengths. Um, again, I wasn't going to say democracy is fantastic. Um, there are some strengths to autocracy. Uh, it's good for focusing a fixed amount of resources on a clear goal. Uh, they do that very well. For example, space exploration or the military are traditionally autocratic. Um, you know, in the military, you don't take votes, right? It's a very top-down structure because of the I, I, because of, of, of the goal uh, of what needs to be accomplished because of the seriousness, I guess, of what's going on. Um, it's a, it's a strong, you know, it's, it has a tendency to certainly be an autocratic structure. In fact, some have complained that, you know, we have democracies protected militarily by autocratic structures. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the USSR, you know, their strengths, uh, if you think of it, are we're, we're certainly military and space exploration. Uh, those are areas we they did really well. Um, Democracy has different strengths. Um, it allows rapid adjustment for unclear goals because it isn't a top-down structure. It isn't a structure that um, where where you have kind of one one person or one group kind of passing information all the way down. You're emboldening people to act near the problem. So in a, in a lot of ways, it's a structure that that enables people who are close to the problem to solve it instead of having to call up the chain to get an answer and then you know wait for that answer to come down and the decisions may be made by people who are thousands of miles away uh democratic strengths certainly uh expand the talent pool uh things like consumer goods and software where you don't have unclear we have unclear goals uh where you want to basically um you know marshal a lot of talent to the problem Democratic obviously works very, very well in those situations. But, you know, it isn't always great for democracy. Uh, this is a, a, you know, a, a rally in Wisconsin for, from a, a year or two ago. It certainly looks kind of messy, but, um, you know, it, it, you get the idea. A lot of people were engaged here. So um, efficiency of democracy, it, un it unleashes a flurry of power, um, of activity based on personal power. Uh, and the, and it, it works very well with fluidity of solutions, right? But it's very hard to predict democratic behavior. Um, it, it's not like you can have a ten, five year plan and say we're gonna you know we're gonna produce X steel during this five year plan. You know it's it's kind of fluid, right? Uh, problems can get stuck. And I think of the United States um, and and even in Europe, I know that we they've got some problems that just kind of get stuck that we can't solve. And it's very frustrating. Um, and, you know, certainly if we had an autocracy, it would get unstuck before good or bad. Um, somebody come in and say, okay, we're going to take care of this problem. I'm not, I don't want to mention any problems, um, but you get the idea. Um, it has difficulty with large projects that span multiple elections. So if it's something that's going to take 12 years to do, is the government that's elected during those 12 years going to remain engaged and wanting that project for the entire 12 year span. And that's why a lot of times uh, things get stuck. Um, you know, I'm speaking, I'm thinking particularly of a, of a, of a tunnel, uh, a railroad tunnel that was built between New Jersey and New York by the Pennsylvania railroad in 1910. Um, uh, it's still being used uh, 110 years later, they want to put in two new tunnels. New Jersey, New York, and the federal government can't agree on who's going to pay for it. So 
we built, you know, one, one railroad company built two tunnels in 1910, and we can't figure out how to build two more tunnels 110 years later. Uh, that's, that's dysfunction, that's stuck, right? Um, but it's a, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar project. Uh, it has a history of cost overruns. Uh, it's just very hard for those governments to get together to solve that problem. Um, so uh, it, it just, I'm just saying, I'm not saying democracy is bad, I'm saying it has negatives. Uh, but there is ultimate success of, of democracy. This actually is a, is a protest in, in Moscow. Uh, I believe it's for Alexei Navalny. Um, uh, but anyway, it, it's an example of sort of de democratic forces that, that, that ultimately, uh, it seems like that's the, the way things are progressing if you look back through history. Uh, so you have the, but, but again, it's a checkered pass. It's not like a, it happens and then it goes away, right? So you have your first democracy in Athens, um, but then it's suspended during the, the I believe, it, the Peloponnesian Wars. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, democracy in Athens, and then it gets suspended because you're in, you're in war. Um, then you have Roman democracy, and it ends in dictatorship with the Caesars and the emperor, right? Kind of a good example. Uh, you have the Middle Ages and you have the Magna Carta and the Renaissance, but again, kind of back and forth. You have the American Revolution, which uh, wanted to give voting rights to everyone, but everyone was not everyone, of course. Uh, black people didn't have votes. Women didn't have votes until the early part of the 20th century, okay? Um, so uh, again, not you know, not like the United States, just everyone votes and we're done, right? French Revolution, uh, French Revolution, uh, it eventually um, leads to riots and anarchy, and then you have the monarchy after that with Napoleon, right? So, or Napoleons, right? So it, it's not, it's not like a one-way street. It, 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 democracy makes inroads, but then it goes backward at the same time. Then it makes some inroads and goes backward. Um, it continues to make steady progress, but again, there are still setbacks. This is a, a great graph. Again, down here at the bottom right is a link to the actual report, but this is the number of people under different types of um, uh, government structures. Uh, the green is democracy. Uh, the red, I believe, the red is autocracy. So as you can see, the autocratic uh, number of people can, is probably pretty steady. Uh, the democratic uh, number of people uh, since 1916 has, has continued to, to dramatically increase. Here's a better picture or a different picture, more looking at land masses and countries versus, um, versus population. At the bottom uh, in blue is the democracy. Uh, the, the sort of mustard color is autocracy. And at the top 2017, you can see there's a lot more blue there. Um, so again, it is a slow, slow progress. Uh, as society sort of haltingly embrace democracy with some setbacks. <laughs> so what does this have to do with software? Um, you might recognize this, this is the Oracle um, uh, Towers uh, from Redwood City. Uh, <clears throat> you might notice that it looks a little like the uh, castle towers that we had in an earlier slide. Um, so it's just, I thought that was kind of funny. Um, so. What does this have to do with software? Um, I think it has quite a bit to do with software uh, because historically when software was created, it was autocratic. Uh, when you think of IBM, Sun, Digital, um, you know, Oracle, uh, all of the HP, all of the sort of big autocratic, we're gonna produce the software, we're gonna give it to you um kind of autocratic software development systems uh it's you know that's that was pretty universal at least when i started in in computers in in the eight, in the mid 80s um and in fact even back to the 70s were super autocratic uh and in those autocratic systems uh executives make decisions so the information comes up from the organization it comes primarily from sales and marketing. Now, if you've ever been in a company, a proprietary software company, most of that, most of the decisions and most of the input that executives get to make those decisions 
come from the sales and marketing departments. Uh, they are, there's some from engineering, but engineering's responsibility a lot of times is just to say no um, to, of what is not possible. Uh, but in terms of what direction to go in, um, it's normally coming from sales and marketing. And then uh, you have uh, engineering basically saying, no, that's not possible. Um, and then maybe changing course based on that. Uh, there is indirect uh, input from customers, but again, it's indirect. It's not, it's not direct. It's got to go through your salesperson. It's got to go through some kind of marketing um, you know, process. And the decision matrix that they that these executives go through when they're when they're making, um, you know, the decision on the software, um, is is pretty unusual. Um, like for example, the first sentence: uh, If we do this, what percentage of customers will we will we gain? If we don't, what percentage of customers will we lose? Um, and and these are really sort of the fundamental decisions that those people are making. Uh, the gains are more sensitive uh, to the decision. Uh, then losses are, you have a tendency to, to uh, as executives, to favor things that are going to gain you market share, and you don't normally are as concerned about losing market share, partially because you assume that most of your customers are hostage or have very high barriers to, to exit, and therefore you have a tendency to favor uh, gains. Um, also, this is why a lot, how a lot of companies uh, uh, destroy themselves. Because they don't realize that they're that they're losing market share because they're not they're on, they're not focused on that um, they're not focused on some of these things um, and then the question they have is uh, if I'm going to make a decision do gains or avoided losses justify the implementation costs that's usually the way they're going to make that decision right so <clears throat> what is what is open source democracy um, well it's kind of a mix between democracy and meritocracy, because again, democracy technically is everyone has an equal vote. Although everyone has an equal voice, ultimately it's the people who are doing the work that have the, the vote. Um, and typically that is uh, specified by meritocracy. Uh, voting can be problematic in open source because you don't know who can vote. How do you do the voting? There are some cases where people vote on stuff, uh, but in a lot of cases, it's really the people who are doing the work who are gonna make the decisions. Um, sometimes you get too much uh, feedback. The term bike shedding, if you've heard, is a case where you just get so much input that you can't make a decision or nobody can kind of solve it. Um, the nice thing about open source is that bad decisions can be quickly corrected because it's software, right? So if you do something, you don't like it, you revert it. Um, and that, that usually works really well. But you don't have a roadmap because there is no autocratic leader or autocratic structure that in many cases is setting a roadmap of where you're going. It's a lot of independent actors all kind of moving together like an anthill kind of, where's the food? You know, do we need to fix this part of the anthill kind of problem? Um, and sometimes it even looks like that. Uh, now, um, the internet is really a requirement, I think, for open source. It allows the uh, sort of very low friction sharing of ideas. Uh, it allows you to iterate through new solutions. Um, and uh, obviously it allows for rapid global communication. So um, just to give you a visual of this, this is the autocratic structure. So the autocratic structure of software has all the company on the left, has the users on the right. And as you can see, there's a very defined flow of how one you get from one part, how the software gets from the left part to the right part, and how feedback gets from the right part back up to the left part. This is incredibly inefficient. This is the way open source uh, democratic development works. The important point here is the users can and often do become involved at every stage of the process, whether it's features, patches, testing, releases or bugs, you have a very engaged user community who are working with the developers at all of these stages. This is why an open source community with no money can produce software as good or better than, a, than billion dollar companies. This is why Linux and FreeBSD are popular and why nobody's installing HPUX or Solaris brand new anymore, okay? Um, let alone like AIX or, you know, some of the other ones. So again, when I was, you know, when I started HPUX was a huge player, Solaris was obviously huge. 
but over this 20 years that I've been involved, 20, 30 years, um, open source because of this efficiency has really taken over. There is a, a, a hybrid open source model, which I'm just going to touch on really quickly. Um, it's what I call the single company uh, software, the open source development model. It's a, co a combination of open source distribution, but autocratic development. Okay. Um, you still have the autocratic decision matrix involved, uh, but you have open source distribution. Uh, it doesn't have the same democratic feedback loop as you typically have, but it is more comfortable for users who are transitioning from proprietary since there is a single company to contact. And there's a roadmap because the roadmap is defined by the autocratic structure. Uh, MySQL, MongoDB, MariaDB, I think are all fall into this rough category. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. I'm just giving you the database ones here. Um, uh, but you get the idea. It's kind of a mixture of the two. It's not all the way open source. It's not all the way autocratic. So where does this leave Postgres? Uh, this is actually a conference uh, picture here. Um, Postgres wins because de democracy wins ultimately. Okay. Um, Postgres uses democracy to attract talent. Um, our talent pool uh, of who we have currently working on Postgres can easily compete with proprietary staff. You know, when I, when I kind of sit back and think about how much we've accomplished in the Postgres world in the 24 years I've been involved, um, I kind of realized that, that, you know, you know, the, Oracle or the other database companies have billion dollar, you know, st uh, companies, but, but their development staffs are relatively small, or even if they're big, they're so inefficient um, that, and, and we are so good at taking all of the, all of the skills from all the people all over the world that we're actually able to, to create a better, a more effective development process um, than that. Um, we have a superior feedback and decision matrix. We don't have that decision matrix that talks about how many customers will we win? How many customers will we lose? Is it worth investing in this thing? That doesn't really, we don't can't invest in anything. So there is no investment, right? Um, it, it, this can be, this kind of can be a challenge for niche software. Again, you've got to be able to attract people to it. Um, and setbacks are still possible, right? You still have sometimes intractable problems. Um, that, that, that are really hard to fix. Uh, but but my, my experience over the time I've been with uh, Postgres is that when we started, we were at the bottom of this red line. Uh, but the important part was not that we were below the closed source options. The important point is that our curve of improvement, whether it's features, performance, reliability, user base, was steeper. So if your curve of adoption is steeper, it doesn't matter how far you start, start from away from the bottom. No matter how far you have to go, you're eventually going to cross and exceed uh, what some, another product has that does not have the same adoption curve. And of course, now we see some of the databases actually you know, dramatically sometimes having you know, fairly steep negative adoption curves uh, where they're losing customers, very, losing users very quickly. Um, but again, that, 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 that angle of curve um, to me was always fundamentally important. So what does it look like in action? Uh, this is uh, Sloanik, our, our, our mascot. Uh, I can't tell you who's in the suit. I have an idea who it is. Um, but again, this is, I think, in, I think this might have been in Brussels. I'm not sure. Um, but again, um, yeah, it is. It's probably a Brussels conference. Um, so uh, Postgres, when it was originally developed, uh, was developed to be extensible. This is back in the Michael Stonebreaker period in the mid, mid 80s at University of California, Berkeley. Um, and that extensibility has actually benefited Postgres uh, dramatically. Um, another interesting thing, and I, I, and I love this slide, is that normally when companies improve their software, they improve in one access. So you say, this is going to be our cloud release. This is going to be our usability release. This is going to be our tooling release, right? With Postgres, we're improving in all directions at all times. So we have a yearly release, major release cycle. Um, we typically have uh, 170, 180 features in every release. Uh, and we're improving all angles, you know, whether it's 
big data, performance, enterprise, ease of use, uh, ease of deployment, we're improving in all directions at the same time because we don't have an autocratic structure. We have all these groups that are all doing independent things and they come together in a final release um, to uh, basically give us this amorphous growth in, in capabilities in, in multiple directions. Uh, we have foreign data wrappers, which allow us to interact very easily with other databases, um, over a hundred of them. Um, certainly you, uh, interoperability is a huge benefit for Postgres. Uh, we have an extension network, uh, which allows us to effectively um, have extensions that you can download real easily and uh, install in Postgres. So again, extensions typically in a database are a bad thing. They're kind of awkward. Uh, but in Postgres, extensions are a natural part of the system. You can add things to Postgres and they look like they've always been part of the database. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the, one of the secrets of why Postgres has become so successful. Michael Stonebreaker, again, when he does develop Postgres as post ingress, ingress being an older database, post ingress, decided it was gonna be the next generation of relational system, developed it starting in 86, this whole extensibility didn't really become popular for 20 years or 15 years. Uh, but now it's a major feature of Postgres allowing us to do things like full text search GIS. It's complex indexing methods, JSON, um, whatever the needs are of the market, Postgres has the extensibility to make that possible. PostGIS, I mentioned, a geographic information system. It is developed as an extension, uh, which is effectively loaded into Postgres, into a generic Postgres database, and now Postgres becomes a GIS relational database. Um, incredibly popular, but an independent team, not really affiliated with the core project. They develop it on their own, all the extension, all the hooks are there for their extensions to work properly. Um, and we have a number of people from that community actually working for some of our Postgres support companies, which I think is, is super exciting. Uh, this is a, one of our first conferences. This is in Toronto. Uh, the reason I love this photo, and this is 14 years ago, is that 85% of these people are still involved with the community. Um, you'll notice I'm right here over here in the blue. Uh, Alvaro Herrera is next to me. Tatsuo Ishii is next to me on the other side. Oleg is back here. Um, anyway, all a lot of these people are still majorly involved in the community. And that's a great testament to a community where people feel valued and they feel like they're making a difference and their contribution is, a, is important. Um, and with a database system as complex as Postgres, you need to keep those people because you need that skill long term. Um, and I think that's one of the great secrets to our success. Um, in fact, this sign right here, um, I actually have that sign right in my office that I'm looking at. It's kind of funny. Um, but uh, effectively, uh, this is an amazing, this is, I think, a great testament to how uh, important your community is to, to the success of an open source project. Uh, I get around a lot when COVID's not sort of hampering my style. Um, I typically go to 40 events a year, travel about 90 days a year. Um, and again, you can see a great spread. One of the, one of the areas I think we're missing, uh, really, I would love to see more growth is Africa and Middle East. Uh, you can see those are two areas that not only I haven't visited, but we don't have as much uh, activity and contributions uh, and adoption in those areas. And, and that's certainly an area I'd like to, I'd like to see grow. Um, just to kind of uh, finish up, how do we do things like voting in, in Postgres? I mentioned earlier that there's a problem of how do you vote in a project that doesn't have, like how do you figure out who a member is, right? Um, we've kind of worked around this. Uh, committers, for example, um, nominate new committers. So your committer team nominates the new committers. Uh, the core team nominates new core team members. Um, so that, again, a similar process. Uh, development is open to all, uh, even occasional visitors. Uh, so there's a very low barrier to entry. Uh, we really have a feeling, let the best idea win. We don't um, sort of, we don't have a limited number of people who can give input. Um, sometimes I'm, I'm working on a project and I'll get an idea from somebody. And the first thought in my mind is, where did that guy come from? Like, where did that gal come from? Like, I've never seen them before. That's a great idea, right? 
Um, so that's, again, uh, one of the things I talked about at the beginning, the idea of democracy, enabling people to feel like they can make a difference, that they can get involved, that they can help move this process forward. That's what democracy is good for. And I think that's what open source development also is good for. Um, just as an as a illustration, I think of our process as, a, as creating a lens. We focus talent like a lens on every task. And when I go through some of the emails, some of the features that we add, the idea of taking all that, all those capabilities, focusing them, focusing them on a single process, and the result, and the result that you see in the major release is the best of all of the ideas and all of the people who have uh, effectively contributed to, um, to you know, to this, uh, to this idea. We don't have a roadmap. As I said, dem uh, democracies typically don't. Um, individuals and political parties have roadmaps, but democracies typically don't. Um, developers and companies in the enterprise DB space, I'm sorry, developers and companies in the Postgres space have roadmaps. Um, I believe enterprise DB has one. I know Postgres Professional has one. Um, I believe Crunchy, I don't, uh, NTT I know has, so we have a lot of companies, they all have their own roadmaps, but again, those are the roadmaps of individuals or of companies, and their only interface to the project is how much their roadmap matches what the overall community wants to do with the process. So again, there is not an official Postgres roadmap, and there probably will never be one. Last, uh, last slide, if you're curious about what the Postgres community is doing, there is a website on my, uh, that I maintain uh, down there at the bottom right is the URL, and it effectively shows you the current IRC chat that's going on, the, current, the last most recent blog, the most recent news article, the most recent commit, the most recent hacker posting, the most recent general question. Um, and this is what, how I actually look at the community, and I make sure that that community, when I'm sort of traveling or I'm just sort of wondering what's going on, this shows me that that democracy is working and that democracy is working effectively. So thank you very much.